Rapid sequence induction and endotracheal intubation are two separate skills, but they are part of the sequential process. For our RSI, indications of this mean the patient needs to be intubated but are at risk of aspiration. This could be due to a number of reasons, such as impaired gastric emptying from the use of alcohol, opioids, trauma or pain, if there is an incompetent esophageal sphincter due to a hiatus hernia or a history of gourd, as well as any pregnant patients, patients with a typical airway, patients with a metabolic disorder, or if they have an LOC with impaired laryngeal reflexes. Any contraindications for this skill include a complete upper airway obstruction that's going to be uh, difficult to get past, and any life-threatening allergies to any of the induction or paralytic agents we're going to use. Complications of this skill could include failure to ventilate our paralysed patient, uh, anaphylaxis could occur, failure to occlude the oesophagus using cricoid pressure, the use of cricoid pressure could also distort the view during our laryngoscopy, um, and oesophageal rupture if the patient starts to vomit. Moving on to endotracheal intubation, our indications for this include acute respiratory failure, cardiac arrest, imminent airway obstruction due to anaphylaxis or burns, um, the inability of the patient to maintain their own airway, and the inability of the patient to breathe effectively. Our contraindications for this are absolute, in which they have a life-threatening allergy to multiple medications we're going to use, and our relative contraindications are a Mal and Patty score that states there's going to be a difficult airway. If there's severe airway trauma, um, and C-spine injury where complete spinal immobilisation is going to be required. Our complications for this procedure include the most common being a difficult airway to obtain, bradycardia, aspiration, esophageal intubation, dangerous agitation, cardiac arrest and dental damage. As rapid sequent induction and endotracheal intubation are time critical skills in a sequential process, it is important to have all the equipment checked, ready and functioning prior to beginning. You can use the mnemonics, soapney or O2 marbles if required to recall the equipment checklist that is required. Our rapid sequent induction drugs include the induction agent, including ketamine at 1.5 to 2 mg per kilo, or midazolam at 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kilo. You can also use propofol or theopentyl. We have our paralytic or neuromuscular blocking agent, succinylcholine at 1 to 2 mg per kilo, or rocuronium at 1 to 2 mg per kilo. We have the option of an opioid such as fentanyl at 1 to 2 micrograms per kilo, and our post-intubation sedation medication, ketamine, at 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams per kilo every 5 to 10 minutes. Don't forget to check your six rights of medication with your partner. We want to check that our functioning is fully functional. We have a BVM that's attached to oxygen and a spare oxygen bottle. Our face mask is fully inflated to suit our patient. We have our airway adjuncts such as our eye gels, our OPAs and our MPAs, our monitoring equipment, such as our O2 saturations, a BP cuff and ECG monitor. We want to have IV access and running fluids, our end tidal capnography, and we want to have a vasopressor. Specific equipment required for the intubation skill include a bougie, a catheter mount extension tube, Various ET tube sizes, make sure that the cuff inflates, lubricant, a bite block, a 10 mil syringe, cotton tape to tie in, a stethoscope, stethoscope to confirm placement, and a working laryngoscope with both Mac and Miller blades. Remember to have your supraglottic airways and your cricothyrotomy kit ready as a backup plan in case of a difficult intubation. Sign and induction procedure consists of nine steps. Plan, prepare, protect the C-spine, positioning, pre-oxygenate, 
pre-treatment, paralysis and induction, placement with proof and post-intubation management. When we plan, we need to brief our team on the protocols, procedures and the backup plans we'll have in place. When we prepare, we need to have our monitoring equipment in situ and make sure it's functioning. We want to make sure that all of the equipment we're going to use has been checked and is functioning and ready and that we have IV access with fluids running. When it comes to projecting the C-spine, we just want to have manual inline stabilisation to look after that C-spine. With positioning, we want to put our patient in the sniffing position with a 10 degree elevation of the head, ramping for our obese patients, and 30 degree upper body elevation for a head injured patient. With our pre-oxygenation, we want to give our patients 100% of oxygen via a nasal cannula for about five minutes prior to our paralysis. For our pre-treatment, we do have the option of an opioid, such as fentanyl, at one to two micrograms per kilo. Then we will move on to our paralysis and induction agents. In this case, we'll use ketamine at one to two milligrams per kilo and succinylcholine also at one to two milligrams per kilo. Placement with proof. When it comes to the actual skill of the intubation, what you do is you pass the laryngoscope through the lips, past the teeth, to the right of the hypopharynx and sweep the tongue to the left. Pushing the blade forward and towards the patient's feet, careful not to hinge on the teeth. You should be able to see the vocal cords. From here, you pass the bougie down along the laryngoscope until we feel some resistance. We'll have our assistant pass the cuffed end of the ET tube. down along the bougie until we visualise the cuff going through the vocal cords. Once this is visualised, we remove the bougie and our blade. Using 5 to 10 milligrams of air, we inflate the cuff. And attach it to the BVM and begin ventilations at 100% of oxygen. In order to confirm placement, we should have seen the ET tube pass through the vocal cords, misting of the tube during respiration, rise and fall of the chest. Upon auscultation, we should hear sounds in the chest cavity, but none in the epigastrium. We have our end tidal CO2 monitor in place, and we should see rising or stable oxygen saturations. Once we've confirmed this, we will then tie in our ET tube with our cotton tape, and begin our post-intubation management. Unfortunately, I don't have the equipment to demonstrate waveform capnography, but I can run you through the theory. So our indications, firstly, for CPR, for our estimation of cardiac output, for the prognosis of CPR, and an early indication of return of spontaneous circulation. We can use it for confirmation of intubation, used with procedural sedation, monitoring patients with increased intracranial pressure, and monitoring metabolic disorders, pulmonary diseases, and adequacy of ventilation. For our contraindications, we don't have any with the application of the waveform capnography. So our equipment includes a face mask, an LMA, or an ET tube, a filter, a monitor capable of capturing and showing waveform capnography, and a side stream or mainstream end tidal CO2 detector. So how do we go about performing this skill? First, we connect the end tidal CO2 sampling tube to the monitor. From here, we attach the airway adapter to the breathing circuit, making sure that the filter is between the adapter and either the LMA, the ET tube, or the face mask. We need to ensure that the ET CO2 monitor is connected and functioning before we perform our RSI or before intubation. We need to ensure the sampling tube is not kinked or tangled. And once the circuit is connected, we need to confirm the presence of a waveform on the monitor. If there is no waveform present on the monitor, there's a few things we can consider. The patient is in respiratory or cardiac arrest. 
the airway or the tube is obstructed, part of the equipment has failed, the intubation is in the esophagus, the tracheal tube has become displaced, or the breathing circuit has become disrupted. Remember to document the type of sampling tube that you have used, the initial pressure of the entire CO2, the waveform present, and any changes throughout the procedure.